Welcome to Four Quarter Lives, a podcast exploring the profound impact of longer lives and careers on everything, countries, companies, couples, and careers. I'm Aviva Wittenberg-Cox, and on this week's Four Quarter Lives, I talk with Michael Clinton, the former president and publishing director of Hearst Magazines. He's the author of Roar Into the Second Half of Your Life and the founder of Roar Forward, a new platform for the 50-plus market and the companies seeking to serve it. His leadership experience makes him the perfect person to share the business case for more longevity leadership from companies. Why should companies care about the new demographics of their workforces and their customers? What should they do about it? And how do you shift cultures to becoming longevity ready? Michael Clinton is also a role model of a new form of aging, the kind that takes up an invitation from a little sister and runs seven marathons on seven continents in his 60s, topping it off with a run down Mount Everest for his 70th birthday. His efforts personally and professionally packed a powerful punch of what's becoming possible with our longer lives and careers. So, Michael Clinton, welcome to Four Quarter Lives. So great to be with you, Viva. I'm very happy to have this conversation with you. I am delighted because, as you know, I'm very interested in why companies should be doing this and how do we convince more leaders to get the business case for longevity and with your extensive experience as a leader of Hearst Magazines. I'm really delighted that we can get your eloquence and conviction behind this issue. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, it's interesting being a part of Hearst, which organically we have always been very focused on having people working longer, contributing longer. We have a very big respect for longevity in the company. Our vice chairman is 91, very active, very engaged. Many of our trustees are well into their 80s. Many of our employees, I was very proud when I was in an operating role as the president and publishing director of Hearst Magazines in the U.S. that I promoted a 70-year-old woman to expand her role Because I think that when we look at performance and when we look at innovation and when we look at the ability to solve problems, for me and for our company, we've always been really focused on the individual and what they might do. And boy, do I wish that I could transport that and take that around to the business world. So I was very fortunate. I worked in a company that respected people and had people work much longer than the traditional years that they might be working in the career. That, ch- that changes everything. Role models changed. inside yeah. the organizations, amongst the leadership teams and owners, that really helps shift the culture, yeah. right? But let's broaden that. So, or use Hearst as an example. What is, in your mind, the longevity case? And You present two sides of this longevity coin. It's both the HR people, talent, internal side that you just referenced. It's also, as was easy, I guess, again for Hearst, it was the external consumer client side of the equation. So give it to us as you would to any company you're trying to convince. I think the first part is American business, and I would submit many other corporate entities around the world, but I'm going to stick to America since I know that market well. There is a built-in systemic institutionalized ageism that lives within the business world. And there are even some companies that sort of have pegged the age of 55 as the beginning of cognitive decline, which we all know is a myth because many parts of cognitive ability actually expand as we live longer. And so if you go through a list of frontline managers who do interviews, algorithms that weed out age prospects, the lack of unconscious bias for first-line hiring managers that, you know, are not instituted there. There are lots of, you know, inherent problems to break through this conundrum because the old notion of 65 and out is an archaic construct as people want to work longer, can work longer, need to work longer can contribute in ways well beyond what was sort of this traditional construct. So there's a lot of work to do with companies. It starts at the C-suite. Ironically, as you know, breaking through the age ceiling is already happening at the CEO level. 
Absolutely. And the irony is the CEO is experiencing that. Partners in big law firms are experiencing that in accounting firms. Board members are experiencing that, but we're not seeing yet trickle down into the rank and file. So how do we break that up? And that's got to come from C-suite leadership that set the tone on that. So from a, I'm just sort of inside baseball here on the internal side, and this is a systemic issue that needs to be raised across all aspects of corporate America in this particular instance. If I can switch over to the consumer side, in our company, what we've done is really created a conscious effort to have representation of role models and people who are, let's call it over 50, through an age inclusivity. And, you know, we're a content company. So in our world, I like to say images matter, words matter, expressions matter. It sets the tone. And so... Many magazines, historically, you would never see anyone, you know, over 40, let's say, on a magazine cover. Now we're leading the charge in a lot of change on that front. We have a magazine called Women's Health, and we just had Denise Austin, who is a 66-year-old, very well-known fitness leader in America. She and her daughter, who is following her footsteps, who's in her 30s. It was a mother-daughter cover, which she was incredibly well-received. We've had Rita Moreno on the cover of Town & Country, who's in her 90s. We've had Patti Smith on the cover of Harper's Bazaar. We've had Harrison Ford on the cover of Esquire. So not just covers, but sending the signal to our readers and our viewers on our sites that this is what the new 50, 60, 70, 80 looks like. Oprah Winfrey, you know, I was on our team together. We launched Oprah's Magazine 23 years ago, most successful magazine launch in the history of magazines. And as you may have read, Oprah's just turned 70. And I emailed her and said, (laughs) you know, Oprah, I've got to tell you, 70 is the new 70. And you are the one who is showing us what it looks like. And I think it's really important for media companies, content companies to really put out contemporary, modern representation, not just from an image standpoint, but, you know, the lifestyle that people now live in their 60s, 70s, fit, tech savvy, you know, doing interesting things, launching businesses, entrepreneurs, changing careers, like very, very dynamic, as opposed to what I like to say, the big quote, wind down, which, you know, is no longer what is really in the zeitgeist. So that's our job as content people are to really play that role. So you're sitting kind of in New York in the hub of kind of youthism, media, culture. How welcome is that message? Are you guys really front runners and outliers? And how much does the internal age of some of your leaders that you just cited influence the readiness of the organization to do this kind of mind rewiring, visual delicatessen of a new form of ageism? Go down. No, no, great question. Let me start first with, I do think that it is seeping into our zeitgeist across a variety of ways. So there are pockets of optimism around this. So certainly you're familiar with Martha Stewart being on the cover of Sports Illustrated. You know, you saw the supermodels who are all in their 50s on the cover of American Vogue, which, you know, would have been unheard of 10 years ago. You're beginning to see it in entertainment. There is a studio in Hollywood that is now focused on producing romantic comedies for people over 50 with actors and actresses over 50. Gee, what a concept. People still want love and romance over 50. It is run by a woman named Amy Baer. And I think it's Glidden now. It's part of MRI. I can get you the exact name and contact. But she just had a movie called Jerry and Marge Live Large with Annette Benning and Brian Cranston. And it's based on a true story of a couple in America who won the lottery when they were in their like 60s, right? So, and she's doing a great movie with Renee Zellweger. And so I think we're seeing it in the entertainment space begin to play out in television programming, the huge success of The Golden Bachelor in America, which is now spawning The Golden Bachelorette, which is really going to be great. So I think you're seeing it play out in entertainment, other media, so on and so forth. I think what's great in our country, Everyone's obsessed with the famous millennials. But what's interesting is the first millennials turned 50 in six years. And so many of the people who are in leadership positions to your question in content and media are, in fact, you know, boomers, Xers, and now these emerging millennials. And they're beginning to see 
that life is very different than it might have been for our parents and our grandparents. And there's already a lot of age angst that is being written about for the 45-year-old millennial. I'm like, wait a minute, you're going to live to be 90. So get rid of that angst. A lot of this shift is being driven by people who are in the cohort who look around them and see that they're very different 50-year-olds than they were just a generation ago. Yeah, it's kind of emerging organically, really, just by people aging into it. In companies, who do you think should be in charge of longevity? Should we have a chief longevity officer or is this just in the hands of the C-suite, get it on the agenda and run with it? That's such a great question. First of all, I think it depends on how big the company is, right? My point of view on this is that companies now have done, in many senses, meaningful job of trying to bring more meaningful benefits to their employees. And I don't mean medical and dental and sort of basic benefits, but I mean things like menopause for women in the workplace. And we have a company that we invest in called Wealthy, W-E-L-L-C-H-Y. It's a personalized app that helps you in caregiving services if you're juggling, if you're a busy mom who's like, working and you have kids and then you're taking care of your parents and you've got a partner and it's a really great benefit that now many companies have. So I think raising the awareness to your employees that they may be living a hundred year life, it's a two-parter. First, it's got to be raising the awareness to the employees that you need to take care of your longevity, your health, your financial well-being, all of the things that go into a long, long quality of life. That has to come through sort of the HR benefits flow, if you will. But on the flip side of it, you have to have senior leadership that is committed to a longevity message and getting that out there. And you and I have talked about, I think is very exciting, you know, L'Oreal for All Generations, where they have 13,000 employees over 50, and they're committed to retraining them, upskilling them, promoting them. There's a wonderful woman here in the States who works for L'Oreal USA, who used to be an operator of one of their big brand units. She's in her 70s, and she was promoted to run an entirely new division of the company. And it's a, quote, real job, you know, as opposed to creating a job for someone. So that came from C-suite leadership uh, saying, hey, we're going to really retrain, promote, and celebrate our employees who continue to perform and excel, you know, into their 60s and 70s. So sending that message through the organization, I think, also does a lot to sort of eradicate some of the ageist thinking, some of the issues around the multi-generational discussions, which are actually more positive than not. Yeah, so a really proactive push to rejig the culture to make it much more longevity fluent, let's say. Yes. Okay, now I want to turn to you because, you know, you talk about promoting role models and showing how you can do it. You yourself are a pretty good role model for us all. I must say, Michael, I haven't met too many. You're the kind who make us sort of middling, healthy folk (laughs) pale in comparison, but we're going to get there. So a little bit about your old story. You started by writing a book called Roar. What got you writing and what's it all about? You know, so I was wrapping up this amazing 40-year career. I had an incredible career in publishing. I was the chairman of the magazine Publishers of America. As I like to say to someone, my cup was full. But, you know, I was ready to go off and do some new things. And one of the things I decided to do was go back to school and get a master's degree at Columbia University. And I had done an MBA many years ago, but I'm very interested in nonprofit and service and the nonprofit world. So I did a master's in nonprofit philanthropy, which I started while I was still in the seat. So I was kind of... That's you know, smart. How old were you when you did that? I was 64-ish yep. when yep. I started it. It was 12 courses, so over a period of time. But It gave me another intellectual outlet, although the challenge of writing papers and taking tests. I was right right back to my 20-year-old self, right? (laughs) (laughs) I I I would imagine. Oh, this is a whole new experience, and they don't care. But it's a wonderful (laughs) trip. You can rebel all over again. (laughs) You know uh, the story. You've done the same. I went back to school. Yeah, Uh, exactly. We didn't have to do tests. And, you know, they don't care that I'm the president of a big company. (laughs) I'm just a student. They're like, what are you Humbling, isn't it? (laughs) Take the test. Anyway, (laughs) everything that I was sort of reading and looking at and studying was 
the whole world is changing by the people. People are driving an enormous amount of change because they're having much more vibrant lives, 50s, 60s, 70s, etc. And there was nothing really sort of celebrating that. So I decided that I was going to write a book about this. And I ended up interviewing 40 incredible human beings who, I'm going to say 50 plus, did amazing new things. We call them the reimagineers. I wasn't interested in someone who was a banker who became a consultant to banking. That's yeah. fine. I was interested in someone who was a banker who decided to become a doctor in their 50s. Like you had to have a 180. And so whether it was career, life, lifestyle, any of the above, all these 40 people sort of exemplified what's possible for someone over 50. And so, you know, when the book came out, it hit a chord because I think that so many people were thinking about this. We ended up having a billion media impressions. We're in our fourth printing. I mean, it was really just like, wow, I hit a nerve with a message that people were ready for. And so that then spawned a lot of the other activities that we're doing. I mean, it's a wonderful book that's just full of these inspiring role models. And I think that's what we were lacking for a long time is role models put a name and a face and somebody who could inspire somebody to follow in their path. So I want you to look back a little bit. You know, this podcast is called Four Quarter Lives and we're going to live to be 100 with these four quarters. If you look back at your very long career and time with Hearst, how would you summarize or metaphorize your own Q2 and then Q3? Were they distinct periods? How did you move from the one to the other? That's a great question. One of the things that I did when I was 39 years old, so I was probably in Q2 at that point, without really knowing that it wasn't a conscious idea that I was setting myself up for Q3 and or 4, but I was 39 years old. I was the publisher of GQ, which was a great job. I was working, working, working. I had a great personal life, love life, family life, all the above. But I thought I was the most boring human being that I knew. <laughs> because many of us, the self-identity is wrapped up in what we do. That is a danger zone. So I was fortunate as a younger professional to say, and I had a boss who said to me, you have to remember it's the seat you sit in that is giving you all of this amazing experience. I literally was having dinner with Cary Grant. I was, you know, Michael Jordan, the basketball player. I was flying to Europe, you know, four times a year with the design world and so forth. And he said to me, you know, if that seat goes away, who are you? And it really like hit me big time that I better start cultivating and developing other aspects of my persona, right? And oftentimes you find people in their 60s grappling with that. And I was very fortunate that I started grappling with that in my 40s. So it gave me a very big runway when I got into the third quarter, because at that point, when I transitioned out of my very wonderful job, I had so many other things that I was doing. You know, I was going to graduate school. I was writing a book. I'm a big adventure traveler. I, you know, continue my adventure traveling. I'm a published photographer who's had shows. You know, I had lots of different things that were allowing me to move into a very dynamic third quarter. And you seeded all those things or some of them in your I, 40s? Because that's kind of the peak of when people feel the pressure of yeah, you know, life. Yeah. Yeah. No, I seeded them all and built on them. In the book, we have a chapter around this subject. It's called Life Layering. Great I'm not concept. Giving, thank you. I'm not giving talks and we're doing a course around it. It's really a very understandable way for people to build the different aspects of their lives. So I like to say that, you know, your kids grow up and go away and they're not that interested in coming to see you that often, right? That professions sunset. You have a partner that hopefully you continue to have or you may not. And we know a lot of people who are 60, who are all of a sudden, the kids are gone, the job's done, and the partner has said goodbye. And who are they? Yeah. And they go through a very panicked phase of self-identity crisis. And if you're 60 and you're living to be 100... It could be a long crisis. Yeah, exactly. So I say start early and start thinking about this beforehand. Okay. When did you start the marathon thing? <laughs> well, <laughs> and why I do love, you do so I love many? That, the yeah. um, well, you know, it's funny. I was a marathon runner in my 20s and early 30s, and then I stopped. And when I was in my mid 50s, 
my sister called me and said, would you run a marathon with me? And I said, when did you start running? And she said, tomorrow. I'm <laughs> <laughs> very good. So I said to myself, okay, I'm around 55. I've probably got one more in me. So I started training and we actually went to London and ran the London Marathon. Wonderful. Because it was on her birthday week. And we so went, how old was she and how old I were you? Think she, well, she's about 10 years younger than me. So she was about 45. <laughs> so we published Runner's World magazine and we went to a party the night before the London Marathon and I met a guy who'd run seven marathons on seven continents, one on every continent. And I said, <laughs> oh my God, that sounds like I got to do it. <laughs> A reimagineer just made for Michael. So there I was at 55 saying to myself, okay, I'm now going to run a marathon on every continent. My sister joined in. We ended up doing every continent. She did not want to do Antarctica. She regrets it now. But when I turned 60, I went to Antarctica and ran the Antarctica Marathon and finished my seven continents and continued to run marathons since then. You know, part of that story. I was a re-engaged marathoner in my 50s. Okay. So for any of our listeners who think that they're a little too old in their 60s to, you know, go from couch to 5K, Michael's the benchmark. (laughs) I'm not going for the seven continents, but I got to say that's pretty impressive. It really is. It's lovely just to know, even if one has no ambition to do that kind of thing, that it can be done, that this is what 60s is now possible. I do have a punchline if you'd like me to give you the punchline. Oh, please. So last year, I did the nine-day hike to the Everest base camp and then ran a marathon down in the (laughs) Kensig Hillary Everest Marathon. And I did that to celebrate turning 70. (laughs) And to your point, Aviva, I say to people, they look at me and their jaw drops. I say, you don't have to do that at 70. You don't have to do that at 40. But I want you to be able to see someone who did it. Because if you can't see it, you can't be it. And so, you know, I'm an accidental role model. I didn't set out to say, okay, now I'm going to be a role model for everybody. I just want people to know that you can do things in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s that it's so much of it is self-imposed barriers. There's so much we can continue to do mentally, physically, all the above as we live longer. So you probably know this book by Bruce Feiler called Life is in the Transitions. And he says that every life has two or three life quakes in it. Have you had any? And would you be willing to share Hmm. what they were and what you learned from them? I think my biggest life quake was really when I was a young man. So, you know, I was from a working class family in Pittsburgh. There was really no history of education in the family. And I was the first one in my family to go to school, to college. It's quite a journey you made. Quite a journey. And when you're a first generation college graduate, you know, it creates a very different sensibility path, understanding all the above. And at 20 two years old, I got on a plane and moved to New York City with no contact and no money and a place to sleep for two months and set off on my life journey. And it was a great one. That was my biggest life quake because, you know, when you're 22, of course, you're a blank slate. You're starting from scratch. But it was a big, from whence I came and from where I was, that was a huge leap that had, you know, a lot of inherent risk and uncertainty and so forth. But I have to say, once I got into New York and I got my first publishing job, with a little luck, timing, and talent, I had a spectacular career. And so, you know, how lucky was I to do that? And then when I sort of got that smack across the face, figuratively, about not self-defining yourself by what you do, that was a real change agent moment for me in terms of building out this life layering concept. So, so far, so good. (laughs) <laughs> healthy, happy, you know, no big, you know, so much of what we achieve in our world, I think, is brought on by our own sense of optimism and being positive about what can be as opposed to what can't be. You posted a beautiful photo of you and your dad on LinkedIn not very long ago. Is he a, a marathon runner? What does he think of how never, far his never, son has never gone? Did, never did exercise in his life. <laughs> dad just turned 91. And I said to him, you know, you're going to live to be 100. And he said, well, you're hoping that's the case, right? (laughs) Because, But I remind him that, you know, genetics, and you know this, are only 20% of our longevity. 
The rest of it is lifestyle. And dad doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, eats right, all the above. So, you know, I've just come back from the blue zone in Costa Rica. And you know the tenets of that in terms of diet and exercise and sleep. And I've lived that kind of life myself. So, you know, I'm um, very much a proponent of a healthy lifestyle. So dad has invested seven marathons into the kitty. I think you're going to live to be 120, Michael. I mean, you're going to prove just how long we can live. As you know, Dr. Sinclair from Harvard has said that the first person to live to be 150 has been born. So we'll see. Are you taking any of his drugs? No, but what's funny is we have with Roar, we've launched a whole business around Roar. That's where we're getting to next. So you're going to tell us all about Roar Forward. I will. And, you know, one of our partners is Walt Cornell Medicine, which is a big, huge medical university and complex in New York. And Dr. Mark Lax, who is our main person there, I've been hearing a lot about metformin. And so I'm going to start taking metformin. You know, I think that from all I hear from the science world is that it's really quite amazing thus far. I take nothing else except a B12 complex pill, but I'm going to start taking metformin. Cool. We will watch what happens to you. I'll keep you (laughs) posted. So that's maybe the pill that's going to make you roar even further forward. Right. But tell us a little bit about the organization you've set up. What's it for? What was the idea of it, along with all the other things you do? Yeah, coming out of the media world, I realized that brands, media, entertainment, advertising, they're way behind in recognizing and acknowledging what is happening in this social movement, which is, by the way, as you know, is global. I mean, it's in totally. you know, all over Asia and EU and so forth. You know, since I come from that world, I really wanted to raise the awareness for this industry. So we launched a company called Roar Forward, and we do a corporate subscription to a report and newsletters and bulletins all about the new longevity and what it means for business and also some personal things, too, that are important. And our clients are big global brands, big ad agencies, you know, entertainment companies. The goal is to get this into C-suite so that it starts penetrating into their brains. So that in their meetings and in their strategy meetings and policy meetings, they really start thinking about this. You know, I think the recent article that you just wrote in Forbes.com about the French companies that have made a commitment to their longstanding employees is a great kind of example of how we need to get all of this ingrained into the business world and the business leadership. So we do that. We do events. We do a summit. We do talks, a lot of C-suite talks. And so the goal is to really elevate the awareness of this longevity phenomenon. And you're doing a great job. It's a really useful report, newsletter, everything to kind of gather all that's being written at leadership level. And that's what I really like about what you're doing is it's a skill up course in longevity leadership. So kudos and keep going. You're sourcing me lots of information. Now, what's with companies? We've been saying that not too many of them are waking up. Why are they so slow? What's the issue? Are you struggling to find the next decade of reimagineers who are corporate executives? I think what will happen is this is going to grow organically. I always make the analogy to the women's movement. You know, yeah, so, the do early I. Days, so do I. <laughs> yeah, exactly. In the early days of the women's movement, we needed to have a lot of role models to show women that this is what they could be doing. They should have a lot more choices and they should be able to run pace and take any direction they want. Today's 25-year-old woman can look around and see other women role models who are doing astounding things in 50 different directions or whatever. We need this to happen now with younger professionals looking and saying, oh, that's what 50 and 60 and 70 looks like. One of the things, and you know this, that I'll go back to the advertising marketing world is they get stuck on youth culture. If you really do the history, youth culture never existed prior to the boomers. The boomers were the ones that created the youth culture because everybody wanted them. They were such a massive population. So you had MTV was born and Pepsi Generation, and we could go on and on and on. The big miss is as the boomers started moving up the age pipeline, the whole marketing advertising world got stuck into youth culture. So then they started chasing, okay, now we're going to chase the next youth, and we're going to chase the next youth. Now they're chasing Gen Alpha. 
the fact of the matter is, is that the boomers are a growth market for them because they have not just new sensibilities, but they have an enormous amount of disposable income, an enormous amount of asset base. They're swapping out of brands. The big miss is that. And so I'm on a bandwagon. One area, for example, is around the creative table where you have the input and in creating advertising. As we know, once upon a time, it was a bunch of white men sitting around the table. Under 35. <laughs> exactly. And then women joined in and then multicultural and, you know, black Americans and et cetera, et cetera. And the representation has been diversified, but you never see someone 50 plus around the creative table. So what happens is the 30-year-old defaults to, oh, well, this is what 50 means, you know, walking yeah. through the sunset. So all those past, cruises, and, you know, all these <laughs> Titanic like, you know, forever. Like crazy stereotypes that if you had that stereotype for any other cohort, you would be, you know, canceled. We need more representation of the new 50 plus world. And, you know, I'm hoping that as some of these millennials move into the space, they're going to drive some of this as well. So what's the best practice you've seen? You've been working with some companies pretty in depth on this. What does it look like? What should we be looking for? I think some of the best practices, listen, it's a balance. We talk about it should be inclusivity. We talk about age inclusivity and a representation of what a modern contemporary image of someone over 50. It shouldn't be a big deal. It should just be incorporated into the messaging. Right. So not a special marketing campaign aimed at the 50 plus, exactly. but every marketing campaign, including right. people who right. are 50 plus. Yeah. And you see someone in the campaign, you go, oh, I can relate to that woman or that man. There's a great company that you may know called Caddis, C-A-D-D-I-S. Yes. If you go to CaddisLife.com, it's an eyewear company. And I think they've done a brilliant job of disrupting in the space because it's very stylish eyewear. A lot of user-generated photography, a lot of really great images of people, you know, call it over 40. And so I think they're a new age company that is doing it really well. You know, L'Oreal, interesting, you know, with Women of Worth, I mean, they've been on this idea for a long time. You know, Helen Mirren is one of their spokespeople and, you know, they were way ahead of this. It gets back to age inclusivity organically, you know, not stereotyping we own a cable network in America called A&E. And it's got the History Channel and Lifetime Television, et cetera. They did an audit of 10,000 television ads that ran. They used an AI tool, interestingly enough. And through facial recognition of these 10,000 ads, only one in 10 faces was over 50. And over one in 20 faces was over 50 and female. Wow. And the in situ was passive, tech avoidant, petting the cat, walking into the sunset, sort of reeking of stereotype. And it's really a call out, you know, shame on the advertising world for doing this because it's just perpetuating something that's no longer relevant. So bringing that message to the marketplace is really important so that companies can see not only what they're missing, but how their communication is really alienating people. Fantastic. Okay. So don't say old, just include it quietly. (laughs) And my last question is, and you already entered into this area, is I'm really interested in the gender differences in Q3, both at work, but also in the consumer market and life cycles and aging generally. I don't know if you've been reading all this press in the last week about how young people until the age of 30 are really splitting in values. There's a 30 point split between super progressive and liberal young women and increasingly conservative young men all around the world in countries everywhere. You of all people must be really sensitive to what's going on between men and women at Early and late. Is there differences in Q3? You've got magazines dedicated. You must have tons of data on this. Do we age differently? Are there super different priorities between the genders? Well, it's a really great question. I'll give you an observation from all the work we've done with Roar, and I'll stick into Q3. We can revisit Q1 when we've got some more time. What we have found with our reimagineers is that women are driving the movement. Women are much more creative, flexible, innovative, risk-taking, 
I think part of it depends on the specific life choices that they had. You know, if they stepped out of the workforce to raise children and they were going back in, that's one set of choices. If somebody was staying in the workplace while they were raising children or had no children or whatever. But what we are finding is that the reimagineers, the most dynamic changes and evolution have been with women. They have made bold decisions about starting a new career, going back to school, becoming an entrepreneur, getting out of a bad marriage, reestablishing and reimagining themselves. And yep. why are women better than men at that in Q3? Well, first of all, I think women are better than men, period, in terms <laughs> of because women have traditionally always had to balance so many things. They're just incredibly good at being, I'm going to say, more fluid and more flexible because, you know, if you're, I was just today on a call with a working mother, CMO, has three small children under six. I'm like, wow, she's a busy woman. And she was like, chop, 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 chop. We got so much done in 30 minutes. And I'm like, I love that because she's busy and she knows how to balance and to really get things done. And I think so there's a skill set there that I think is traditionally more with women than with men. So I think you're going to see a lot more reimagination from women that because a lot of men sort of still struggle with looking at the possibilities that they might be able to have. I mean, I realize that's a generalization, but I think that that's what we're finding in our real work. I think you're absolutely right. I'm a little concerned. I don't know if you are about men in Q3 as they exit sort of a traditional working life, I don't think there's a lot of support, recognition, or convening to help them transition gracefully into these lengthening later lives. Do you think yeah. there's a missing piece there? Do you do anything yeah, in there? You're absolutely right. I think that gets back to, I wrote a piece for Esquire called Why 65 is No Longer the Number. And, you know, a lot of the way we've been conditioned is, well, you're 65, you retire, you move to Florida, and you play golf. I'm using that yep. as sort of a metaphor. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what a lot of men are finding is they're like, woohoo, you know, I'm going to retire. I'm going to go to Florida and play golf. And then about a year or two into it, they're like, well, this is not really that interesting. <laughs> and then they realize that they're going to live to be 90. And they're like, now what am I going to do? And so I think getting people, men and women, but getting people more equipped before they make that decision yeah. that these are the various journeys you can take is going to be really important. So there's actually a whole body of work around that. We have our work cut out for us between us. Okay. I've got to conclude this time has gone whipping by one suggestion for companies listening, one suggestion for individuals listening. What would you share? Well, I'll start first with the individual. You are on a personal longevity journey. And you have to like open up your mind to realize that assuming you're healthy, you're going to have a very long life with a lot of different options and opportunities and experiences. And you have to open yourself up to what is your favorite future look like and how do you pursue that? That's one of our your uh, favorite um, future. I like that. That could be a good yep. book. Yep. 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 Thank you. And you know, for companies, I'm making a note of that. Uh, <laughs> for companies, I think that the key thing is to, if you think about the crushing expense that government's going to have with an aging population, companies can play a role in being creative and inventive the way Japan does and the way Singapore does to be able to embrace their longtime employees and celebrate them and retrain them and promote them and be the role models of a company that does that. Very much like at the top of this conversation where I was talking about Hearst, which is a company that has historically done that and continues to do that to this day. So it really lands on C-suite leadership to have that mindset and ability to lead. And speaking of C-suites, you're going to be joining me in Lisbon for the world's first longevity leadership program that I'm co-directing at Catolica Lisbon this coming June. So you will inspire us, as you have today, with your unstinting energy and vision and a really solid business case. I really look forward to seeing you there. Thank you for being with me today. And thank you for joining us in June. Can't wait Thanks to see so you. Much. Thanks so much. I hope I see some of your listeners at the conference, the program in Lisbon. Thanks. I'm you. sure you will. I hope you will. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. See you soon. 
For more thinking about the impact of our four quarter lives, you can read my column at Forbes and subscribe to my Elderberries newsletter on Substack. Let's design lives that aren't just longer, but better. <laughs>